Okay, I'm a B. Brown consultant, but that will not influence my talk uh, today. Um, well, this is a real big challenge uh, to talk about anatomy uh, and then following a real anatomist uh, and, and the stage um, and try to make sense in 20 minutes. So I have picked my fights. Uh, I will not obviously describe from top to bottom all the, um, the features that we can use in anatomy to make our blocks better. But instead, um, I have just taken a few issues that I would like to discuss with you and hopefully uh, promote some discussion and, and put some uh, questions and in, in perhaps a few answers in your mind. Uh, obviously, we're all familiar uh, with the fact that a nerve has nerve tissue and connective tissue. I want to, uh, you to uh, pay attention more now to the connective tissue that is associated with nerves. Uh, the connective tissue associated with nerves can be both neural, the usual epineurion surrounding a nerve. Here we have two fascicles, the perineurion and inside the endoneurion. That's, you know, that's well known, and obviously the epineurion will form the skin of the nerve. But the nerve, as it advances through embryological life to their target, passes through all sorts of different tissues, and it gets surrounded by connective tissue. And if you look here, uh, you cannot define with naked eye the division between what is extraneural connective tissue, the local connective tissue that I call, and the tissue, the connective tissue that belongs to the nerve. But obviously, because the nerve grows and the nerve moves and the nerve has some uh, flexibility there at that point, I, did I get the music? No, that's just mine. Oh, well, so, that, that was way too fast. Well, so in between the two connective tissue, there is a potential space. And that potential space, if we do a clean cut, if we cut the, the sausage and we see all these little things inside, we don't see that space. But evidently, there is a space. And my point here is that in this space that I have uh, recognized by moving the nerve a little bit, you can see that there is a plane of cleavage. There is a plane of cleavage between two different connective tissue, one that belongs to the nerve and one that is extra neural. So now, when we advance our needle and we start injecting as we get close to a nerve, the local anesthetic breaks the small additions and eventually finds this plane of cleavage, which for being a potential space, represents a plane of lesser resistance. And by falling inside this plane of lesser resistance, expands it and produces what we, unfortunately, we have called the donut sign already taken uh, in sonography uh, to uh, talk about interception of the intestine in, in kids, uh, which I prefer to call the lagoon, the perineural lagoon. You know, more artistic on my mind, I, I, I think of a lagoon when I expand this space. The point here is that when we see a true donut sign or very uh, neural lagoon, what we're seeing actually is the expansion of a potential space which will be delineated on the inside by the epineurion of the nerve and on the outside by the extra neural connective tissue. And I think, you know, that's, that's very important for what is uh, the next step that I would like to discuss with you. I wrote a, a recently an editorial about the intraneural and extraneural issue, and I know that it will be discussed, I, I believe, tomorrow or Sunday. Uh, but I would li like to give you a few um, uh, updates about what, what my thoughts are in this regard. So the epineurion here of this nerve will represent the skin on an individual. So an individual has organs inside and vital organs, and the outside would be his or her skin, and a nerve would be the epineurium. Now, any uh, violation of the skin and a projectile that perforates the skin will be an injury to that individual. So as an analogy, I would say that any violation of the epineurion 
would be an injury to that nerve. That doesn't mean that uh, the, if we go back to the analogy of the person, maybe an organ was never touched so that individuals survive without any problem, but we cannot negate that if a knife went through the skin and didn't perforate anything, the guy was not stopped. So with the nerve, it's exactly the same thing. If the epineurion is violated, we should say that we have an intraneural uh, occurrence. But most likely, the injury to the nerve would be represented by the penetration of the fascicles. We're not absolutely sure about that, but that's what it seems to be at this point. However, we will have to establish the epineurion as the outer layer of the skin, and whatever violation of that outer layer should be considered intraneural. The problem is when we talk about plexuses, and I think that this is where the confusion exists in the literature. This is a dissection I have done in my own laboratory in Chicago. This is the left side, the supraclavicular area, brachial plexus, anterior scaling, vertebral artery, middle scale in the back, C5, C6, C7, C8, T1, the three trunks, and the beginning of the divisions, and then the origins of the cords uh, here in the infraclavicular region. The suprascapular nerve is also seen there. Now, the point I want to make in plexus is, uh, there are two important uh, points. One is that each nerve, each individual nerve that forms a network, a plexus, has its own epineurium. So, for instance, if we're thinking about the brachial plexus, when C5 is originated at the level of the uh, intervertebral foramen, the dura sleeve will continue histologically with the epineurium. So each nerve that constitutes a root of the plexus has its own epineurium. And by extension, when C5 and C6 get together, the upper trunk has its own epineurium. And then when the uh, upper trunk splits into two divisions, each one of the divisions will be rubbed by an individual epineurium. So putting a needle in between, for instance, here, the upper and middle trunk is not only necessary to accomplish uh, a plexus block, but should never be considered to be intraneural. That's what is necessary to do in order to do plexus anesthesia. So the second important point when we think about plexuses as opposed to individual nerves is that I have, I have compared in these dissections I have done, here is what we usually show. You know, C5, C6 again, C7, C8, T1, upper, middle, lower trunk, suprascapular nerve, anterior division of upper trunk, posterior division, and so on and so forth, subclavian artery, uh, uh, phrenic nerve, anterior scaling. Well, all these nerves are shown naked here, but before we could demonstrate them, I have to remove the uh, Prevertebral fascia, a dependence of the prevertebral fascia that bridge over the anterior and middle scaling to form a compartment. So the nerves are behind that compartment. So an individual nerve does not have an extra layer of connective tissue, but a plexus does. So in this case, now, as an, how can we uh, move this uh, video? Let's see if I, we can get ready to go. Here I have put a, one of my residents there to try to stab that prevertebral fascia to see the tenting of the fascia under the pressure of the needle. We're not trying to penetrate it at this point. Look at how the nerves move underneath. We're not, not trying to penetrate. You're trying to demonstrate that there is a sturdy fascia there, which is this fascia, that evidently has to be penetrated in order to get a, a plexus block. So this, unfortunately, has been uh, equated with doing an intraneural injection. And uh, I, I want you to remember that, uh, that intraneural would be defined by the violation of the individual epineurium. So, for instance, here, this is an axillary uh, cross section I have done here. This is the axillary external sheath. And here are all the individual nerves, a couple of veins, the artery, and this, you know, in the, in the ultrasound imaging. So obviously we will have to perforate this fascia in order to accomplish our block. Because otherwise we will be depositing our local anesthetic outside a sturdy fibrofascia, fascia and our block will not work. And again, that will apply 
in any space where there is a plexus is. Here we have the interscaling, uh, stenocleidomastoid, anterior scaling, middle scaling, uh, the roots of the plexus here. And this white uh, hyperechoic uh, um, image represents the connective tissue that is filling the styrofoam that is filling the space that was covered by the previous tube of fascia. So here in another croc section I have done, this is C5, this is C6, this is a anterior middle scaling. So now this is the previative fascia or dependence of the previative fascia and then there is loose connective tissue around. This fascia has to be penetrated in order to accomplish the block, a plexus block. And we're doing exactly the same than we do when we do an individual nerve, when we approach the nerve and we expand the space and produce a donut or peri uh, neural lagoon. This should not be considered intraneural, as erroneously has been considered in the literature. And putting the needle between C5 and C6 is not only not intraneural, it's what you have to do in order to get a plexus block. Let's continue. That will be a matter of an of a, of a editorial, hopefully, uh, that will come in the next issue of regional anesthesia. And, uh, and the last issue regarding this is the special situation of the sciatic nerve. The sciatic nerve is not a plexus, but it's not a single nerve. It's a nerve composed of two nerves that happen to share a trajectory, but do not exchange fibers. So common peroneal and tibial nerve uh, travel together for a significant uh, distance, and then they split without ever having a, a mix of fibers. Now, these nerves, as any nerve, the, and here is the tibial nerve component, and this is a picture from Dr. Reina in Spain, and this is a common peroneal component, and these are two branches, uh, ha, have their own epineurion. And this is vital in understanding whether we are intraneural or not, extra, uh, or, or extraneural. So this is its own epineurium for the tibial component, and this is the own epineurium for the uh, common peroneal component. Now this is connective tissue with a high degree of fibers that condense around and form this common sheath, just like in a plexus. So inserting a needle into this space in between has been called subepineurial which is a wrong term because it gives the sense that you have penetrated the epineurion and you are under the epineurion now. This is not a common epineurion. This is a common connective tissue, extra neural connective tissue sheath. And each nerve inside has its own epineurion. So injecting here is actually a very good idea because you are now injecting inside the structure that has two circles and those two circles have better or bigger surface of absorption, so uh, probably the onset will be uh, better. Now, going a little bit into the upper extremity, I have seven minutes to go, uh, identifying the roots. Uh, you already know that a cervical transverse processes have an anterior process and, in, and posterior processes, and from this anterior process is where the anterior scaling inserts, and from the posterior, both the middle scaling and the posterior scaling. Uh, the uh, tubercle C6 has been considered to be prominent and has its own name, but if you compare, really, it's no more prominent, uh, at least in this case, than, than, than C5. Actually, C5, you could make the argument that it's actually bigger than C6, but the fact that C7 usually lacks an anterior tubercle makes, perhaps, the palpation of C6 more prominent. Now, the lack of anterior tubercle here at the level of C7 could be used to identify the level at which you are located. So here we have two shadows and a nerve, and in the next one we have only one shadow, the posterior shadow, indicating that most likely that is the root of C7. Now, with respect to the pleura, uh, usually when we talk about the pleura, we think about this section, the dome of the pleura, which I have painted yellow here in, in this dissection. This is anterior scaling, this is a first rib, so we are talking about this level here. This is the, the trachea and the larynx, uh, the brachial plexus, the subclavian artery, which I have section right there, but the subclavian artery goes on top of the pleura there. So this, we usually think of that pleura. But don't forget that the pleura continues then under the first rib to become the parietal pleura of the first intercostal space. So we have pleura lateral also to the first rib. 
And I think it's very important that when we're doing supraclavicular blocks and we're getting the shadow of the first rib, that not only we have control over, over where the dome of the pleura is, which will be this part here, but also that at the end of this edge here, which will be the lateral edge of the width of the first rib, we start having pleura again that is not visible here, but it will be about this level, which could potentially be injured when we insert the needle in plane from the lateral side and we lose it here. Look at this distance. To the bottom of the, of the, of the image is 2.2 centimeters. So it would be very easy to injure the pleura at the first intercostal space. So keep in mind that the needle should come into the image before you make the, the determination as to what angle you're going to need. So I usually insert the needle superficially here. I have control of where the, the tip of the needle is, and then I direct the needle to where I'm going. Uh, going to the lower extremity, it is known that as opposed to the upper extremity where there is a magic point which happens to be at the level of the uh, crossing of the plexus uh, under the clavicle on top of the first rib where the, the whole surface area uh, it, it shrinks to a very small level. In the lower extremity, there is not such a magic point. So we cannot do uh, one injection that will uh, produce block of both um, uh, the lumbar and the sacral um, uh, plexuses, um, at least not in a, in a very uh, uh, reliable way. Uh, so keep that in mind. The other thing is another publication that should be coming soon to the regional anesthesia that has been accepted is a work that I did with some people in uh, Montevideo in, in, in Uruguay about the role of the lateral uh, cutaneous nerve of the thigh. Usually this nerve is like, you know, uh, it's a nerve that we only think about in neurology paresthesica and that we answer for exams and then now we have fun uh, looking at, at uh, with ultrasound because it's very easy to visualize next to the anterior superior leg spine or on, anterior to the uh, sartorius. Uh, what we have found that in a significant uh, percentage of cases, the uh, cutaneous innervation of the anterior thigh is being given by a prominent lateral cutaneous uh, nerve of the thigh. And I, I will not show you the proximal picture, uh, but you can see it in that publication that is coming. But this nerve that seems to be arborized here on, on top of the patella that could give the sense that it's a femoral nerve, in fact, is a lateral femoral cutaneous nerve. So we both did dissections and um, ultrasound-guided blocks of the lateral cutaneous to show that. Um, this is, I don't know, a man of uh, Karmakar is in the room, but this is for him. Uh, this is the lumbar plexus seen from behind, uh, transverse process in, uh, of, C5, of uh, L4 there. And you can see the femoral nerve there and so is there. My point is that uh, although I do not negate the fact that the uh, uh, branches of the lumbar plexus pass through psoas at one point or another, also at one point or another, the lumbar plexus uh, nerves are located between quadratus and psoas. So that can be used, uh, as, as you can see here, this is quadratus, this is psoas. And, and then, so this image can be seen as, um, you know, as, the, as a point where you will inject for uh, lumbar plexus. You don't necessarily have to uh, do, a, do a, a, an injection intrasoas. And the last thing I'll mention is the obturator. Um, it's, it's usually forgotten that, you know, in this study, I uh, think in 2002, uh, it, it was demonstrated that obturator nerve cutaneous innervation was missing in over 50% of the cases. So when Dr. Winnie, my mentor, did his uh, study, the classical three-in-one study, and then determined by pinching the skin whether there was an obturator nerve uh, involvement when he injected at the, at the femoral side, actually most likely he was getting anesthesia from the femoral. So three-in-one, I spent a long time saying it does not exist, but in fact, just a few years ago I found it, that it does exist, it does exist. It actually lubricates, cleans, and prevent rust, but it does not, it's not a block in regional anesthesia. Thank you very much.